Good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Parsons, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar titled Lamb Meat Quality. This webinar is brought to you by the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association. We'd like to thank them for their support and encourage you to visit their website to learn more about the American sheep industry. There you can access a large volume of services and resources available from ASI to help you be successful in the sheep business. The URL for the ASI website is www.sheepusa.org. You can access the Let's Grow program materials by clicking the Rebuild link under Programs on the main menu. You can also access it directly with the URL www.growourflock.org. Links to these materials as well as recordings and uh, slides from our past webinars are also posted on the Let's Grow website along with a lot of other great learning resources that they have there for you. We're slated for a presentation of about 45 minutes in length. That'll be followed by 20 to 25 minutes of questions. Feel free to submit your questions uh, anytime during the presentation or after it during the Q&A session. You can do that by typing them into the question dialog box at the bottom of your control panel. I will be monitoring those questions and moderating them to our speaker during the Q&A session after he's done with his presentation. If you have a microphone, you also have the ability to ask uh, questions to the speaker directly by raising your hand. I'll go over that process in a little more detail before we start the Q&A session. So with that, it is my pleasure to go ahead and introduce this evening's speaker, Uh, Dr. Travis Hoffman is our uh, speaker of the night talking on lamb meat quality. He has a joint appointment as the Extension Sheep Specialist for the Departments of Animal Science at North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. He has a passion for understanding the production decisions that impact lamb quality while striving for production of the highest quality lamb and superior customer satisfaction. Travis has taught several sheep-related courses and authored or co-authored numerous articles on sheep and lamb industry topics, including authorship of the Lamb Quality Chapter of the 8th edition of the Sheep Production Handbook. Previously, he served eight years as the Colorado Beef Quality Assurance Coordinator, a joint appointment with Colorado State University, Colorado Cattlemen's Association, Colorado Livestock Association, and the Colorado Beef Council. And he was most recently employed as a meat sciences instructor at South Dakota State University. He's a native of South Dakota, if memory serves me correct. I'm not going to hold that against him. I'm going to applaud him for that. South Dakota That's people right. are good, right, Travis? <laughs> bet. So, so, Travis, it's great to have you here. I'm going to turn the microphone over to you and uh, sit back and enjoy your presentation and then uh, come back on during your Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, be a part of uh, this funded program from ASI uh, Let's Grow, but also focus a little bit on uh, some passions of mine relative to lamb meat quality. Just a little bit, as you said, uh, I had the opportunity, of course, uh, to now work at North Dakota State University and also have a joint appointment with the University of Minnesota Extension and uh, being able to provide uh, my abilities and and hopefully some resources to stakeholders uh, within those two states. But I want to draw back that at least this is uh, certainly a, a tremendous opportunity from when I was just a, a youngster in junior high of saying, I think it's exciting to try to learn and determine if and why products are of more value and, and products are uh, potentially uh, of higher uh, quality and higher value within our industry, in the lamb industry. And so I think there's some great opportunity to be able to discuss a little bit of those topics on our, uh, our seminar or our webinar uh, yet this evening. The first thing that I'd like to touch on is uh, as we describe and, and look at American lamb and, and how we can have a, a potential impact on it is I think that it's most important to identify where we're at relative to the bullseye and the targets that we're producing. And I think it's so critical, and this is why this topic is so exciting to me. So my apologies if I get too thrilled, but for those of you that you know, uh, I try to stay optimistic and excited about what I'm doing. And this is an individual by the name of Spot in the lower or in the upper right-hand corner there. That's an Ile de France that was actually uh, born in Minnesota. In fact, we were we were able to harvest him 
in our NDSU meat slab, and you can identify that he's one that's trim and no doubt muscular. As you move down, there's one that had plenty of trimness, and in fact, some might say just on the edge of acceptability. And yet, there's one that with a, a quarter in the middle of the pan as a frame of reference, this guy named Spot uh, had a, a loin eye area of 6.2 square inches. Now, is that perfect? I don't know, but yet he was still tender. He was still flavorful, and that's certainly a high-quality one. I would predict it is pretty close to a target of um, on the edge. Now, are we going to be able to do that consistently, nor will we want to? Probably not, but I do believe that lamb is a trendy protein, and I think it's something that we can be able to have value for within our industry. For these first couple minutes of our presentation, I want to shape and frame the discussion and what we're trying to accomplish. And we're looking at both consumers and food service and retail individuals as well. Roughly 40% of consumers have never eaten lamb according to the American Lamb Board. And in fact, I think we can be well aware that many probably haven't tried it. If we had more people that have tried it, and certainly as we look at differences relative to generations, we can be able to hope to have more repeat customers. It's common information that males eat uh, or consume a slightly larger amount of lamb. And in fact, those with a greater amount of income uh, are more prone to consume lamb. In fact, those that are considered lamb eaters or choose lamb, they expect to spend approximately 30% more into their sales or into their retail uh, purchases. And of course, we're well aware that lamb can be consumed in, and uh, at special occasions. I'd like to draw your figure there to the right of lamb consumers prefer buying American lamb. And in fact, again, this is some summary information accomplished by the American Lamb Board that said uh, that not only would they prefer buying it, but also half of them are willing to pay for it. Now there's certainly a little bit of a price disparity in comparison to our competition. And that's why we need to focus on our quality attributes. I put this in here as well from some information looking at total US lamb sales, but most particularly looking at that retail uh, portion of, of merchandising. The part I found more entertaining is uh, uh, we can certainly identify the uh, weeks or time of the year where we expect uh, our, our Easter um, to uh, have a spike in, our or spike in both our dollars sold and the pounds. And in fact, the pounds followed this very closely and I, I just left it with one graph. And we see a little bit of uptrend there at the back end of our calendar year. 38% of those households that buy lamb um, or that, that buy lamb for home preparation uh, each year. And in fact, there's a couple different growing areas that previous people that, uh, within our industry have identified. Some of those are the millennials and those individuals that are able to make a little bit of money now and be able to uh, uh, be adventurous in their, in their purchasing options. And then also uh, with some of those mature perfectionists, as some of the people have termed, of people that are on the back end of their career and just want to do something a little bit more entertaining in what they're accomplishing. In calendar year 2016, the average price of all lamb cuts was $6.97. In fact, in comparison in 2016 at retail, we had an increase in lamb dollars sold of 1.5% and an increase in the pounds of lamb sold of approximately 3.7% relative to the amount of, of pounds sold at retail. I also wanted to provide some information for you to show you just where we're at relative to prices. These were features uh, recorded by USDA Ag Marketing Services for lamb products that looked at bone in leg of 570 a pound, which was the most featured product, followed by racks at 1085 a pound, loin chops at 782, and shoulder chops at 498. Consequently, you can see what some of those prices are that are at the retail store and be able to draw that information. In terms of percentage of, of cuts and primals that we do have, the largest one that goes to retail is our loins. And in fact, also then followed by leg, rack, shoulder, and ground. Additionally, not only was that uh, in intriguing from a price standpoint of loins being the highest, but when we look at them from pounds sold, 
there's differences. And in fact, I wanted to put in and show you the information that may or may not different relative to region and location in, across the country. In the Northeast, they consume the most amount of lamb. In fact, most of our major markets are in the New England uh, area. And their preferred cut relative to the pound sold has been leg, followed by Southeast, California, and Mid-South and shoulder. And then there's a balance of leg at, at the bottom three and loin in the West. And in fact, being in Fargo, North Dakota, and calling my region the Plains, we're the lowest in terms of region of per capita consumption of lamb. But across all regions, we have a U.S. lamb per capita consumption of 0.88 pounds. And we've stayed within approximately 0.8 to 1 pound per person per year for a relatively uh, stable time now. I wanted to tag in the top 10 restaurant trends in 2017. And in fact, there's several different things that uh, as we look at it in Trendy, as our young lady there at the grocery our market uh, was making her decisions. And I know that Dr. Jay Parsons was trendy in his day too, but I'm hoping that he's retired the tie-dye bell-bottom pants. The top three or top six restaurant trends, natural ingredients and clean menus, environmental sustainability, and fourth and six, the locally sourced meat and soy and seafood. I think those all three pertain to how lamb can fit into those restaurant trends what lamb cuts are being used more often. Rack of lamb is first, followed by the loin shop, as we would expect, but there's still some market share out there for those restaurant opportunities for sausages or morgues, shank, loin and leg and shoulder as you move down. And in fact, I think it's evident that we're having some increase in lamb and lamb burgers. The picture on our right was one from Proof Art Artisan Distillery here in Fargo, and we were able to get that North Dakota State University lamb on their menu here just this past month. I was certainly excited to, to build those relationships and to continue to get lamb on greater amounts of plates in terms of restaurants. With our ethnic marketing, we have an opportunity to meet uh, the needs and requests from several different individuals within our American scheme of consumers. In fact, there's, I put a, together a small collage of, of information such as a halal market, uh, some that would be, again, closer to uh, focusing on uh, Hispanic or Latino ind individuals. And one of those there, as we look on, excuse me, up, up here at our top right areas of it, these ones were just quartered uh, into particularly primal cuts. The intriguing thing about that is that the shoulder, the rack, the loin, and the leg were all priced the same. So there's certainly not that value differentiation in some of these uh, locations. But I think it's fair to say that lamb fits well with an, ex an interest and increased interest in ethnic cuisines. People that want a bold flavor, people want something that's more entertaining for us, can look through Mediterranean, Spanish, Caribbean, Middle Eastern, French or Thai restaurants. And in fact, I showed a couple different options. The one in the top right, simply neck bones that were at um, a more Mexican dr driven um, or grocery store. There was also Asian food with thin sliced leg chops. And in fact, on the left, we also had in our national lamb quality audit, at least an option to be able to purchase lamb heads if we so chose. I want to touch ever so briefly, and in fact, this could be a highlight for future uh, webinars or information, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about lamb quality and at least po poke a little bit relative to the non-traditional market and realize that not only is this continuing to grow, but it's changing the game. In fact, to the right there is a picture of the New Holland market, in which case uh, individuals that I've worked with and students that I've worked with said, hey, Travis, uh, the prices are going down in uh, some of our auction barns and auction markets, but the prices are going up and in New Holland. And I think as we look at it and continue in our history, we need to realize that it's its own game. Uh, what happens in the New Holland markets is certainly uh, changing the atmosphere that we have in our, our sheep and lamb industry. I punched on Producers Livestock Auction Company because they're focused in San Angelo, Texas. And in fact, one of those um, pictures there as we look down at may or may not look a little bit historic. I'm as fan as much as anybody as uh, some 
some wool sheep and some horn bucks that we find there to represent our Rambouillet breed. But simply put, there in te Texas, at, at least, there's some pictures of some individuals that are dorper and, and white dorper driven. And I think that those uh, certainly match uh, some of the things that uh, both Capra lamb and IO, IO ranch and Twin Creek dorpers and different individuals like that are able to accomplish. In fact, in our middle picture at the bottom there, I showed a picture of our lambs that we have at North Dakota State University, and those are purebred Romanovs. Now, do purebred Romanovs fit the commercial production? I'd simply say that's going to be a stretch. We're not going to want to take those to 120 pounds, and in fact, certainly not 140. But I'll guarantee you those that were merchandised on uh, the week to 10 days before Easter, some of those might have uh, found their own spot relative to our sheep and lamb industry. So the question in the National Lamb Quality Audit is, what is lamb? And the first thing, this was our open and introductory question, the first thing that comes to mind is young sheep. And in fact, that's intriguing to me at the very least because I was kind of hoping that they would at least think of a, a loin chop or uh, something on the center of the plate, but we have a little bit of a challenge relative to that uh, description. And of course, some people in our consumer or consuming public that may make that correlation between Mary had a little lamb and not want to make that connection to a center of a plate item. The second most common option was red meat alternative, followed by delicious and flavorful attributes, delicacy and high-end meat, and healthy proteins. So as part of the 2015 National Lamb Quality Audit, we evaluated 60 people in retail and 60 people in food service. Those were a combination of supermarkets, butchers, and direct farmers markets, and of course, fine dining, casual dining, and purveyors. I wanted to just draw you to a little bit of the information that we were able to gather at that retail setting. And in fact, the retail case is so different from lambs that could were sold as whole carcasses at 315 a pound to a location there um, in San Antonio at the HEB, where the American Lamb Board was running a feature and a special to help sell um, and merchandise lamb with the show for Lava Lake uh, Lamb and being able to merchandise that uh, at even some of our more progressive uh, grocery stores. Of course, it went to as high end as ones in Beverly Hills, where the prices would be $19.99 a pound uh, on several of our different cuts or even higher. We also have a great standpoint and a grasp relative to lamb in the food service case best or excuse me in the uh, food service uh, atmosphere and in fact as we draw between these we're approximately 60 percent uh, retail and 40 percent food service here's a quick picture relative to defining lamb quality and uh, you may recognize uh, mr mike harper an individual that feeds as many lambs in america as any as anybody that there is. And in fact, I got to join Mike uh, for a, uh, a luncheon uh, at Reno, Nevada, when uh, the ASI convention was there. And, and we had some of the best uh, lamb that there was. And, and you can see that plate to the right. But I think we need to be imperative that we evaluate what we're accomplishing. And, and that's what makes it intriguing because Mike was so excited as he looked at the circumference and the size of those um, rib chops and the lovely and, and delicious flavor. A little piece of Mike Harper died that day when that chef said that that was Australian lamb. So we're going to define lamb quality, and that was one of the things that we looked at of what are the quality traits uh, that drive purchasing decisions at retail, food service, um, and purveyor sectors. I'm going to touch quickly on these, but uh, we're going to talk about origin, sheep raising practices, eating satisfaction, weight and size product appearance and composition, product convenience and form, and nutrition and wholesomeness. Now you might ask yourself, which one's gonna be the most important? And in fact, I hope that you do. Well, the most important one was eating satisfaction, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. We are also given an opportunity to define what each of those meant. On eating satisfaction, it most commonly meant lamb flavor or taste. Origin, interestingly enough, was most commonly identified as locally raised, not American. 
which ranked second. Sheep raising practices include grass-fed and humanely raised. Product appearance and composition was lean to fat ratio and then fresh lamb color. And as we move down relative to the priority, weight and size, we just wanted consistency on cut size and weight. Nutrition was uh, termed as healthy and product con convenience and form. We're not worried about the French rack. We're worried about availability of if it is at the grocery store. So with our evaluation of what was considered a shares of preference and look at the identification of which of those seven criteria were the most important, eating satisfaction, the first one there in the purple, was more than double any of the other individuals at 38.9. We followed that with origin, as we said, local and American, sheep raising practices, product appearance and composition, weight and size, nutrition and wholesomeness, and product convenience and form. In fact, when asked if these were things that would be a requirement, two of them came up. Those would have been origin and sheep raising practices, meaning that if they were going to merchandise those animals or merchandise that lamb, there was a couple things that those had to have. And that might have been local or it might have been American or from a sheep raising stand practices, it might have been no antibiotics or no hormones or whatever that labeling claim may be. There was some that had from 20 to 25 percent there had a requirement. But if we were asked the question of with, were they willing to pay a premium, eating satisfaction was most commonly the attribute that would be willing to pay a premium for, and in fact, up to 18.6 percent of a premium if they could ensure eating satisfaction. To bring this in and summarize our introductory information, why do people purchase lamb? And in fact, the largest reason that people purchase lamb is because of flavor. We have the opportunity to provide quality eating experiences because of flavor, but it was also imperative as we describe that and move on with our research and tonight's discussion is that the reason that people purchase lamb is because of flavor, but the reason that people don't purchase lamb is also because of flavor. Another key message that we were able to uh, grab from the information is that the local movement is real. No longer is it just a trend or just a niche to be able to merchandise our products and particularly our protein products, but those that were interested in grabbing onto that, building that connection and being having that connection with the farmer and rancher certainly added value along our sheep and lamb supply chain. I think as we continue, that's something that we'll expect to see. And, and as it certainly offers a lot of opportunity for those young entrepreneurs or individuals looking to uh, market through a different niche. They're an opportunity to be able to connect yourself along that supply chain and be able to merchandise your lamb. We also talked about embracing the pastoral image and environmental stewardship. And if you remember from the restaurant trends, one of the top six is environmental sustainability. And in fact, people believe that Sheep and lamb production is a sustainable practice, and we can be able to do that at the highest level, uh, being able to uh, have that importance on, on how we work and how we work on a stewardship and husbandry of our animals. I want to touch just quickly on country of origin. And in fact, again, this could be one that could uh, be a, a future topic, but most importantly, lamb has a greater competition from imports. And in fact, it's it's understood that there's more imported lamb merchandised uh, in the U.S. than truthfully American-grown uh, lamb. Now, when asked from uh, large uh, operations of, of why that, that make those changes, those can be for different reasons and why they put their emphasis on it. But in fact, if we were to uh, merchandise all of our American lamb, we simply couldn't be able to meet um, the requirements. I think we can continue back and hope to gather some more of that market share by no means. The last slide I've got before I want to shift directions a little bit comes here. And in fact, here is a, a lamb shoulder chop that I was able to purchase in my hometown when I lived in Fort Collins, Colorado. Now, sure, the lamb shoulder blade chop was uh, 0 0.87 pounds and sold at the Albertsons at 7.49 a pound. But I think it's interesting uh, as we look at it from our country of origin labeling that this one was made in the U.S. But ladies and gentlemen, 
it was born, hatched, and harvested. And in fact, this is new biological information for me to determine where those uh, lambs are hatched. I don't know. Hopefully, it's not in your backyard, but most of them are lambed a little bit more natural than by an egg. I want to draw this up and uh, look at a, a little bit, and we're going to take that shift uh, with our 20-minute uh, intro there. We will also have then a shift re looking at end product quality, and then we'll be able to, uh, on chapter three of our presentation, evaluate those in our own option operations and identify how we can get better uh, with implementation of our, our products and our ideas. So here's as big a summary slide as I could put together. And in fact, it came from a, a textbook that was written by um, Sarah Erasmus and others in, in just this last calendar year in 2017. And we could provide information on age, gender, diet, breed, plane of nutrition, and condition um, or uh, at slaughter as well. But there's also some post-mortem handling uh, that has an impact. Again, as we describe those and, and you see from there, storage and handling is important, making sure that those uh, animals that are, as it changes from a carcass, are chilled at the correct rate and level because that way we can have an impact on our muscle pH. Refrigeration is critical. And of course, cooking conditions as well. And if we know anything relative to uh, lamb, we can do a lot of good things correct. And if we cook it wrong, certainly cause a, a less than preferred eating experience for, for others. Then as we go through that and we cook those um, products, we're gonna have differences and particularly most of the flavor profile changes on lamb. It's going to be fo focused on our lipids and focused on those fats and those branch chain fatty acids. And as those are cooked and goes through uh, reactions, it provides that meat aroma and flavor, and particularly more of that lamb aroma flavor that we're more normal and, and accessible to. Now, now that we know that and have that chart memorized, we know how to hit our target. And in fact, it's really easy. Well, I beg to differ. In fact, it's a complex system that I'll try to draw through, uh, and it's certainly not an easy uh, type of portion on trying to draw everything together, and I credit those that are able to accomplish it and build those branded programs. But one of the challenges that uh, causes the most problematic world, if you were to build your own uh, production system and wanted to have your own brand, is product uniformity. An individual with the National Lamb Quality Audit, uh, when interviewed said, if we could only make lambs with big racks and loins and small shoulders and legs, and that's just simply not how this works from a biological standpoint. But I'll always give credit to our processing facilities and our harvest locations and even the cutting room floors because lamb is able to make a variety of cuts that can be merchandised with retail and food service markets. Particularly as we're currently driven in a commodity market, I think it's exceptional of what our processors are able to do to merchandise the big, the small, the skinny, the fat. Here's a quick example. And if you remember how big that quarter was on the old loin chop that we got from Spot, the one on the top row was uh, loin chops that were able to be purchased in Wisconsin at a grocery store. Those had over a three and a half square inch uh, ribeye area. And in fact, the ones on the bottom, they're American lamb too approximately 1.4 square inches purchased at a Whole Foods in Florida. I'm going to let you read these uh, three quick uh, quotes that we received relative to age determination for lamb. So 65% of the respondents requested young lamb. Most of the time, that age determination for lamb, when asked to purchasers of food service, retail, and purveyors, they said that those are under one year of age. But in fact, I think that we have a true void in our industry relative to defining where lamb is. According to the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service and the standard of identity, if you were to merchandise a product that said lamb, L-A-M-B, 
on the label. It only needs to become or come from an ovine animal, young or old, skinny or fat. Now, if we want to be able to have a quality grade on it, it needs to have two break joints. And in fact, here on our left uh, vision, uh, that is, oh, is a break joint. That is a break joint. And this is a spool joint um, on to the right. Now, if we're able to have those, uh, again, in order to be young, you have to have two break joints. I grabbed information from USDA Egg Marketing Service from just this past week's information, and 7.6% of the carcasses that went through were quality grade prime, 92% were uh, quality grade USDA choice. From this last week's group of lambs that made it through the processing facility, we were yield grade two and three at approximately 64%. Now we're aiming for yield grade two if you're on a grid-based system or at least the yield grade three. And I think it's fair in my personal assessment to consider it unacceptable to be nearing 30% of lambs in our consist that are yield grade four and yield grade five. Now I don't think it's fair as we describe this to be able to assign blame because the people within our industry are doing the absolute best that we can to spread out the seasonality and the challenges that we have in our U.S. sheep industry. And in fact, if we can be better at supplying a fresh and consistent product, we can be able to provide a better product. But right now, we're having some challenges. I think it's interesting as I shift back to some of the data from the National Lamb Quality Audit, of and collected in 2015 and asked, do they evaluate USDA yield grade? Do they use USDA quality grade? And in fact, 8.3% of the retailers used yield grade in their selection. 33% of the individuals surveyed use USDA quality grade. I'm willing to say, and truthfully challenged uh, personally to say, it's not that intriguing to be a commodity-based and commodity-driven system. I hope that we can continue and move forward, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. This is some information done from my colleague, uh, Fila Gomez Nito, in 2009. And in fact, does a quick comparison relative to the yield grade one, two, three, four, and five on the bottom and the expected primal yields. As you can see, those trends moving in a downward direction, if we were to pay the same amount for a yield grade five carcass as we were a yield grade one, we're going to have a lower percentage of product that makes it through that fabrication floor. I just think it's important to show a little bit relative to where we're at on prices uh, of our products. This was information from this past week that, for an example, a 70 pound carcass is worth approximately 220 pounds, or $220, excuse me. And in fact, I wanted to show you the differences relative to the wholesale prices or value with leading that with rack, loin, actually four shank moving into third and leg but of course it's the addition of shoulder rack loin and leg that attribute to the greatest amount of our pounds and of course the greatest amount of our end value there's a tremendous opportunity and uh to be truthful with those uh, of the 199 attendees that we're currently listening uh right now uh, i think that there's an opportunity for lamb instrument grading to change the game, to allow us to have a value-based marketing system and program that we've never seen in the uh, commercial and commodity industry that currently exists in, for our, our sheep and lamb producers. It takes pictures, much like that to the left of the, of the carcasses with a side view and a rear view, and then is able to use those uh, evaluations and dimensions to be able to determine potential USDA yield grade, USDA quality grade, also predicted primal yields, and ovine carcass cutability. I believe that when we get this information, that we will have the opportunity to realize the decisions that we made across the chain and across our supply chain on how we were able to make those improvements. And in fact, I got this slide uh, from Superior Farms that looks at a possibility for a producer portal. Individuals potentially believe that may, we may have instrument grading as early as this summer or uh, at the back end of this summer, potentially uh, as beginning at the first one being in the Dixon, California plant. 
That's yet to be determined. And of course, I've been optimistic for a while, so we'll see where that one rolls. But with this, we have an opportunity to improve information transfer. You'll be able to go, if particularly if you have an electronic identification tag that identifies those lands and individuals, you could be able to look up potential yield grade, cold weights, uh, shrink percentage, and expected primal weights. And in fact, the picture of this carcass expects a loin to be 5.2 pounds, the rack to be 7.4, the leg to be 20 pounds. And then we can have the opportunity relative to product improvements and from a production and carcass standpoint, we can be able to have pro a product inventory management and have an expectation of what's gonna be in the coolers at the end of the day. Now, not everything is perfect. In fact, uh, on our uh, travels across America, this was an individual uh, that was a, a, a retail case, a retail sales and, and butcher individual at uh, in, in the Salt Lake City area. And in fact, he had some challenges there relative to shoulders and products that had too much seam fat, too much external fat. And I think that it's a, an indication that we need to be, continue to be able to evaluate what we can do. Are we improving quality with the knife? And uh, there's no doubt that the, our processing facilities are challenged, partly be from the animals that come through. As we said, that almost 30% of them are yield grade fours and fives, but should we put all of that um, emphasis on, on their world to correct what we're doing? In fact, I've been tasked by the American Land Board and working on completion of a project evaluating the cost of fat. It'd be imperative to at least evaluate that as an industry, we need to be better at that. But let's look at this from an analytical standpoint. In fact, Ms. Carissa Maniotis now with Superior Farms is shown there taking a picture uh, of some products and, and she was certainly helpful in gathering information for our 2015 National Lamb Quality Audit. But where are we at relative to lamb product dimensions? We can't just sit back and say, well, we've got a supply challenge and we've got a product challenge. Well, do we? And in fact, U.S. lamb loin chops averaged 3.03 square inches for longissimus dorsi or loin eye area, and we were had an advantage over Australia at 2.6 and New Zealand at 2.25. So we've got more muscle, but we've also got more fat at approximately um, 0.3, 0.33 across the fat of that loin chop. Uh, New Zealand is also uh, similar but Australia is able to do it a little bit trimmer. Relative to tenderness or, uh, evaluations, we also looked at that. With the tenderness though, we can look at, was there a significant difference? And in fact, the US had a slightly a less tender product at 1.9 versus the, for the rib chops there, excuse me, versus 1.52 and 1.57. And so, there was slightly differences. I would potentially attribute that most uh, to uh, age of lamb of the Australian New Zealand being slightly younger. Uh, however, I'm willing to say that, ladies and gentlemen, that one doesn't matter. A, a value of 2.2 would be the average for the SOS major or a beef tenderloin. So, ladies and gentlemen, we can move on from tenderness being a large challenge relative to. Uh, our consumer acceptability. Lamb is tender, and lamb is really tender. And so I really believe that that's not the one that we need to focus on. The next step is, and that we'll finish up this presentation with in the last 10 minutes here and allow ourselves still again 20, 25 minutes for questions, is to evaluate where we're at for the future. If we could be able to do some things correctly, I think that we can set ourselves up, hopefully, as I first off evaluated where we were at in our chapter one of this presentation of retail and food service. Secondly, again, focusing on our lamb quality audit and current standpoint, but I think that we need to dig and see if we can solve the challenge and be able to accomplish hopefully some things on improvements in lean meat yield, eating satisfaction, and producer profitability. These are just three lambs that I think uh, uh, just shine really nicely for us and are, are representative of three of our breeds that we have here at North Dakota State University, of course, going from left to right of Columbia, Hampshire, and Dorset. 
So I think it's important as we look at it from a producer standpoint, and again, this is why I'm so passionate about what I do, is that when we work so hard, particularly as we move through here to the, the waning parts of April, people have worked so hard, whether that was in January and February or, or March and April, of, of getting these young lambs on the ground and, and working to keep them alive. And so we think, okay, we've done that. We've got that. Now we got to work on our nutrition. Now we got to accomplish this. And I'm so excited because being trained relative to a meat scientist, we try to gather that information along the way and try to predict if and what we can expect along the way. Now we've got some options relative to our production system as well uh, in related to breeds. And in fact, I believe uh, uh, there is some small differences relative to consumer acceptability, but we could talk about that at a, a later point in, in reference because truthfully, one of the main things that happens relative to wool breeds is that Australian research says that the Merino has just a little bit stronger or has a little bit stronger flavor intensity than some of the other ones, and we could potentially expect that. The meat breeds, of course, from a growth and production standpoint, we're going to have that advantage and we'll have that advantage relative to the amount of ribeye or loin eye areas produced. That's their job. That's what we use them for. Of course, we can improve growth. Of course, we can improve some carcass merit, but it may or may not come with some antagonisms along the way. The next thing is, is in fact, uh, uh, we have certainly some evolution and some growth related to our hair breeds, whether those are dorpers or white dorpers on the top right, and in fact, those four white dorper bucks are ones that we've got out at our Dickinson, North Dakota uh, unit uh, that we uh, are able to accomplish some research on. And going across the bottom, we have uh, a, a Royal White or St. Croix influenced animals, and then potentially even Katahdins. And it's fair to say that certainly as we talked about it initially, um, hair sheep in terms of popularity, in terms of how they fit into our systems as currently evaluated is certainly important. So we need to make sure that that's something that we keep in mind uh, because people are being able to excel with them as they so choose as well. But let's be real. I just evaluated in a generalities meat type sheep, okay, or those meat breeds, the wool breeds, and then all the hair sheep breeds. But in fact, we all know that uh, the consist of our lambs, particularly here, in the northern plains and upper Midwest of North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. These were lambs collected by uh, Dr. Jeff Held, Dave Olia, and myself this past summer and looking at how these animals uh, projected on the processing side relative to carcass merit. But I think you can be aware that there's obviously going to be some that are going to be white faced, some black, and across our industry, there's going to be plenty that are in between as well. Now, this is somewhat of a busy slide, and I apologize that, but I think as we evaluate it, there's a couple of things that we can grab from it. If we look on our left axis, this is carcass weight from the highest to the lowest, and of course, we had a pretty good bell curve of the most right there in the middle, and so we aimed at the right spot. In fact, at a live weight of 137 pounds and a dressing percentage of 51 uh, approximately percent, we did some things right. We got the whole group. Of 356 about where you'd want it but ladies and gentlemen as as we look at this i hope that there's 200 people on here that would say i don't know if 0 0.32 on a 12th rib back fat is acceptable i would prefer that to be less at 137 pounds and i know that 200 or 2.36 of a ribeye area is subpar to me and so i think that we have improvements that we can be able to make well, if we're going to make those improvements, we have some resources that we could try to accomplish. We have the National Sheep Improvement Program looking at growth traits, reproduction, wool, parasites, and different indices, but I want to focus on those carcass traits. Those that can be measured include loin muscle depth and fat depth, and we also have an indices that can be used on the carcass plus indices. But in order to gather that information, we have to have the ability to end resources and the opportunity to evaluate ultrasound for carcass value and carcass merit. If we could be able to do that from our ultrasound, then we could start being able to have a little bit more accuracies to those estimated breeding values that could be collected.
And in fact, I'm relatively convinced that we're way behind. Australia on its genetic trends shows 2007 to 2014 improvements in post-weaning weight, lean meat yield, carcass eye muscle, and truthfully, they decreased their carcass fat, but they are not aiming to decrease any carcass fat anymore because of keeping that livability and that um, hardiness to their animals. So I don't predict that they want that to go any lower, and they have it. Now, there is some antagonistic traits, and that intramuscular fat could potentially cause uh, decreases and potentially cause increases in shear force. But then again, we're up to 1.8, 1.9 uh, shear force in Newtons. That's still uh, a longissimus dorsi muscle that's extremely tender. In fact, we need to be careful. Now, if we're saying that people want to purchase American lamb because it's the best, I sure hope so. But we have to be proactive in what we're doing because our Australian competition is using animal performance, carcass measurements, and in fact, of these estimated breeding values, their next step is having an eating quality value that can be a deriving value from tenderness, juiciness, flavor, and overall liking. They're making some progress in genomic testing, and we've got a lot to learn from those that consider it a large part of their industry on what they're trying to accomplish. I want to finish strongly here looking at lamb flavor. And in fact, research that was done by Carissa Maniotis and, and others at Colorado State University here this past year looked at lamb flavor intensity, lamb, yearling, and mature individuals. Now we predicted that lamb flavor would increase with age, but in fact, that's just not the case. And the yearlings were actually lower significantly than the lambs. Why is that? Well, part of the reason, in my personal opinion, is, is that those yearlings and even the mature use were in a lot lower body condition score. Those lower in a lower body condition score and having less fat, that's where that flavor and those branch chain fatty acids occur. However, there was a difference related to off flavor. And those that were a little older or more mature did have a greater increase in the off flavor. For those of you taking notes, this will be what your test is on. Just kidding. Okay, so lamb flavor compounds. I just want to touch on a couple of these. The three methyl indole, the one on the top left, uh, is considered skatol. Okay, and so skatol is one of the two compounds that is most attributed for in swine boar taint. And in fact, in lamb, that indole of and how it is made. Uh, as a branch chain fatty acid uh, is also important because that one is most contributed to what is considered the pastoral or that grass or that um, somewhat more to, to use the word gamey or stronger grass fed type approach. That's the, comp um, the, the compound that's most uh, considered that. These other uh, three, okay, with four methyl octanoic acid, for methyl nonanoic acid and for ethyl octanoic acid. Those are ones that also attribute to more of the lamb flavor. And in fact, I think it's, it's, it's exciting that we can identify compounds that can be attributed to lamb flavor or mutton flavor intensity. So can we sort our lambs on flavor? And in fact, this is a research accomplished again at Colorado State University that said with 84% accuracy, they could be able to put those lamb carcasses in the correct bucket. The 67% would be in mild, 75% of them would be correctly assigned to medium, and 92% of them would be correctly assigned to bold. Can we be able to market lamb-like coffee? The potential exists, and that's with only evaluating seven different compounds. If we can get those seven different compounds accomplished, we can be able to provide that and be able to sort it. Now, I will tell you before we dig in on this and say that this is the answer is that we don't particularly know yet what our customer wants. Some people prefer that milder flavor and those more naive lamb consumers would prefer the milder flavor. But there's also part of our consumers that want the stronger, more powerful, bolder and more robust lamb. Just gonna finish up, uh, and Jay, I got 
uh, just a, a moment or two here to finish these last two slides on the research that we're accomplishing at North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. And so these lambs on the top uh, started as part of our research project. And in fact, my graduate student, Laura Groovy, is also shown there as we're ultrasounding uh, some of these ram lambs. Uh, and in fact, for the quest uh, to improve our product and improve our, our lambs that we have. We did an initial study, and primarily one of the things that I'm most intrigued about is evaluating the true difference related to lamb and related to eating satisfaction of rams versus weathers. There's differences and disparities in the research of if and where those challenges happen. And in fact, we took some of those into the first group there uh, to a relatively common 140 uh, approximately uh, carcass or live, excuse me, live weight for both Columbia's Hampshire's and Dorset's. You are well aware that there's differences related to end um, live and carcass weight, and we saw those because we took them to the same uh, carcass weight to see if there's some differences uh, breed related or not. We're still working on gathering that information from the University of, of Minnesota and working on a taste panel over there with them. But additionally, we on our second trial while I've been here, we looked at this group of Dorset lambs uh, as a young group and then harvested them at the at a young or physiologically immature level, at a medium or mid-level, and then at a heavier level, in which case the rams weighed 185 and the weathers weighed 160. So I'm convinced that, or excuse me, uh, uh, that those um, animals uh, were certainly a little farther past the preferred spot. I want to draw your attention there to two carcasses, and I, I know that it's a little smaller relative to the slide, but those were uh, a ram and a weather. And of course, uh, working with our, our shepherd, uh, Mr. Skip Anderson, who's been ultra important for our research that we accomplish here at North Dakota State University as well. Uh, one of those stayed intact and then the other one is castrated. Those twins, um, there was a difference of approximately, I believe 11 pounds of carcass weight. And in fact, I had a couple there uh, that were uh, full twins uh, to be able to evaluate. And we'll take that information and then we'll gather uh, carcass and um, eating quality satisfaction for us. Which ones are going to be the most marketable? Which ones are going to taste the best, be the most tender? We're not certain yet, but there's at least uh, approxim there's approximately 20 pounds, depending along the way, that it will continue to increase differences on live weight in comparison of the rams versus the weathers. I want to just draw your attention here as we sum this up and still allow ourselves 20 minutes of of questions for us is that I had our one picture that came from the textbook and said, hey, we can describe all of these uh, topics and all of this information. And yet there's through uh, an hour approximately of this uh, function, uh, there's still some differences. Breed isn't that big of a difference. Uh, there's not that much difference relative to eating satisfaction. Sex and gender uh, would can potentially increase as those animals become mature. Yet we don't know if a 150 pound lamb that's intact that hangs out as a, a Dorset uh, in, uh, uh, in in rural Iowa, if that has a difference, okay? Do those that are 200 pounds in Suffolk and out in Salt Hughes and then go to town? Potentially, but there's a difference relative to those farm flocks. Diets, those that uh, potentially are on more of a grass finished or legume finished uh, will continue to have a greater intensity of lamb flavor as a generality we expect age and maturity to increase flavor but particularly off flavors differences in cutability what we're striving for we want to make sure that we get those animals uh, to harvest minimizing our stress and of course chill rate is important dr jay parsons i'm going to open it up for uh questions uh, um and i want to just leave it i have just a couple or slides at the back end but uh, I'll let them as a group uh, evaluate and look at the farm to fork mentality on seeing if and how we can try to get those things accomplished. And that's just a small list, but some of the things that I think we can consider, consider just a little bit more influential. Thank you, Dr. Parsons, and I look forward to you guys' 20 minutes of uh, conversation. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Travis. You, we've got a lot of questions that come in, so we'll, we'll dive right into them. Um, 
keep in mind that you can type your questions in using the question box. You can also raise your hand if you have a microphone and I'll unmute you and you can talk to Travis directly. And uh, um, Steve, I realize you raised your hand when he was talking about the instrument grading and I'll get to that in just a moment. So be prepared uh, uh, for me to unmute your microphone. So Travis, a couple of quick questions that came up early on. You had the prices up there from Easter lamb. Um, was yep. that American lamb or is that all lamb or was that imports what was that outstanding uh that's a that's a good question and uh that is data collected by fresh look uh marketing for the most part and that is evaluating all uh lamb in the retail case uh so to the best of my knowledge that is uh putting american and australian and new zealand uh in together and there's some further research uh that we conducted at retail cases um in our national lamb quality audit and no doubt um the American lamb is the most expensive, but at least at, during that time period. New Zealand was in a solid second, and Australia was in a third spot relative to price per pound. So yes, that was all of them together. Thank you. Yeah, no, good. And and right around the same time when they were, uh, you were mentioning the importing. Um major importers into the U.S. is You mentioned Australia in particular, and you just mentioned New Zealand. Is Australia the major uh, importer? What are the percentages there uh, as far as people importing lamb into the U.S.? Great question. Uh, so Australia is the major importer. I just looked at the USDA Ag Marketing Service information for this past week, and uh, approximate, so of what was imported um, this past week, Australia was about 60 uh, to 70 percent of the total, and New Zealand was the other 40 percent. But one of the things that I, I thought that this question might come up, and so one of the things that I looked at is, and if if I get this wrong, if somebody has a, a better information and can correct me, that's fine. But from my evaluation of it, the amount of lamb that was imported from Australia and New Zealand this week it would be approximately six weeks of those levels would equal what we export out. Okay. And so from a net trade standpoint, uh, obviously we're importing a substantial, you know, eight to 10 times more than we would be exporting uh, of our own product. And so there is some trade differential uh, for that. But again, a large uh, retailer, uh, and the largest retailer uh, in America of lamb, when asked, well, why don't you, why don't we get American lamb? And he just laughed at me because there, we can't continue to fill all of our supply chains. And so we just got to be really good at what we do and uh, to identify and build those relationships, particularly uh, with different grocers and retailers. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and we had an excellent question come in when you were talking about the importance of origin, in particular local source lamb, maybe even more so than it being American, right? Um, but yep. uh, somebody asked about the processing situation. You mentioned, you know, some big processors in your talk, but the question was, how do we support more qualified processing plants locally? I'm two and a half hours from a USDA processing plant. I'd love to sell individual cuts to stores, restaurants, but can't do to travel costs. Any any questions or co or any comments that you can make about the situation of trying to get local processing done? Well, uh, that's a great question. And if I had all those answers, uh, uh, I'd be worth a lot more. The difference is, uh, Jay, um, on that one is that you're not going to be, if, if you were going to try to do that, what you would want to do is identify other colleagues or other uh, collaborators uh, in the, whether those would be beef, pork, lamb, chicken or turkey or whatever it may be that would be willing to help uh, build those markets because realize that you don't want to lose all your profit um, by somebody that would build a, a couple hundred thousand dollar uh, processing plant uh, in your area. And so some of that is a uh, limitation, no doubt. But I think, I think big picture um, with that is that you have to identify of, of if that travel to that location can can be offset uh, by the the profit uh, potential and, and a lot of, and some of the times uh, Jay uh, that is the limiting factor. Now I will tell you that in as the best of my knowledge in North Dakota and in Minnesota as I'm continuing to learn this, people can get a license to have on 
farm harvest or build a location. The difference is, and I know Minnesota is even more challenging than North Dakota, is that you have to have a full enclosure. You have to have access to clean water. You have to have sanitation protocol. And so the difference of the upstart of getting the 30,000 to 50,000 or whatever that may be uh, becomes a challenge for even the on-farm or identifying uh, slaughter operations. And of course, importantly, as we look at being able to merchandise our end product lamb is that we also need to identify the difference between custom exempt, state uh, inspected and USDA inspected. And so if you choose a custom exempt plant, those you can't merchandise to somebody after the fact. Now you can sell it to your neighbor Susie and it goes in with their name and they can provide the cutting instructions. But in relation to state and USDA inspected plants, the state allows you to, of course, be able to merchandise within your state. And the USDA, in fact, allows you to be able, able to merchandise uh, online if you so choose. So I apologies, my apologies to uh, the question uh, originator there is that truthfully, that's something that uh, that makes it a, a hard hurdle to be able to evaluate. So I wish you the best in terms of if you so choose to build local individuals and then maybe get a group and say um, that we're going to take a trailer load of pigs and sheep and, and two calves to that person. And then you could be able to minimize your transportation uh, challenges and losses to that location. Okay, since we're on that topic with you know the transportation and the stress that goes with it, uh, we had a question that came in: uh, Is it better to take lambs to the slaughterhouse right before slaughter, or let them settle in a day or two? Uh, would you like just in general to address the stress question in terms of the stress that goes on lambs right before slaughter and how important that is in quality? Thank you, and I, I figured that this would be a question that would come up, uh, Jay. And so I did some research, and in fact, uh, Australia is much better at evaluating stress than currently we are uh, in relation to um, on gathering that information. But even in Australia, they put the identification of saying that what we can do on Im improving larage and transportation as well, but they don't particularly say that, that one is better than the other. And in fact, I think that um, if, and, and to give you an example relative to stress is that one research project ran lambs around for 15 minutes to try to um, show signs of stress for them and then harvested them. And yet there was still enough glycogen stores that it didn't change the muscle pH. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is evaluate end product muscle pH. But big picture on that one, uh, I'm gonna say that truthfully, we can do what we can to minimize our stress, but it doesn't have nearly as big of an impact on slaughter information or that's what our research potentially uh, suggests uh, in comparison because those animals are rarely challenged by dark cutters in comparison to beef and are rarely challenged from uh, pale soft and exudative like pork and so they're more susceptible to those stress challenges or less susceptible excuse me Okay, one more question, then we'll get to the people with their hands up here, and I apologize. There's a ton of questions here, folks, but uh, and this has to do with breeds. You already alluded to that quite a bit uh, with the differences in breeds. We've had a lot of people ask about that, so I'll just give you three examples. Uh, one of them is, uh, uh, is there any evidence of taste or meat flavor differences between breeds? Somebody asked, what's so special about Corydells? And then somebody else addressed... That was, that was a planted question. Yeah, and then somebody else uh, asked about uh, it relative to uniformity, because you mentioned the importance of uniformity, and their question was, you know, how do we get uniformity with 200-plus breeds running around? So uh, just go ahead and tackle that. I know that you have a slide here for I, us I can, to look at. Absolutely. Good. Uh, it's the slide up, I believe, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, and so I'll attack that one first from a uniformity standpoint is that I don't envision that we will ever get to a uniform standpoint. We need to identify what our target is, but we have too much variation um, that if I wanted to say that everybody needs to have a Cordell, which is obviously the correct answer, uh, according to the second uh, question, uh, my family has Cordells, but that's not, that's not how we're going to do this. Um, but 
then uh, so I don't know if we'll ever get there, but hopefully we can have less in terms of the outliers. Thanks for bringing the question. And, and Jay said that this one was coming up. And so I have this. This is from information accomplished by Shackelford at the Meat Animal Research Center. And let me draw you to a couple things relative to slice shear force or tenderness. The suffolk was the high est, okay, with dorset and the composite high est. Which one was the most tender? That was the fin sheep, okay? Was there a difference in tenderness? Um, the fin sheep, again, was um, the most tender from a consumer standpoint. The least tender was a suffolk, okay? But that's because there's more meat product in comparison. Differences in juiciness? Those are so small. You have to realize that these are on a one to nine scale, and there's a difference between 5.6 and 5.49, okay? That's, while it is statistically different, uh, that is certainly not something. And then the, the last thing here, there was no different statistical difference in off flavor, but one of the things that is critical on, okay, we're making it on lamb flavor intensity is that we thought that, the merino and more of our wool breeds would have a greater flavor intensity. And one of the things that the conclusions that Shackelford said is that truthfully, there's not a big difference. And in fact, the Romana or excuse me, the Dorper and the white Dorper and even the Katahdin, we thought that those hair sheep might have less lamb flavor intensity. And that was not proven to be true in the, the most comprehensive study that we have in lamb flavor big picture and then this is what the australians say as well uh, jay is that there is greater difference within the breeds than there is across the breeds and until we can get that eating quality ebv uh to be able to provide us a little bit more information just consider them uh similar uh this data says that they're very similar relative to true eating quality this is one of the more negated functions of our lamb quality uh attributes Okay, fantastic. Okay, let's get to some of the people that have their hands up. Steve, I know you had a question on the instrument grading. I believe that's when that came up. Um, are you available that you can unmute your microphone for us? I'll give you just a second or two. Okay, there he is. Steve, are you there? Yes. Okay, go ahead and ask your question. Good evening. Um, when, when we talk um, about yield grade uh, fours and fives, I think we have to identify the fact that that uh, the, our, our U.S. lamb is a premium product, and and I think the the um, the food service definitely needs to have some of that product, and so um, I think we have to really target um, who who uh, who we're, who our consumer is. And in that case, I know yield grade fives is, is probably a terrible product, but I think that yield grade four product, the threes and the fours, is probably a, a premium product and we need, to be, we need to be marketing as a premium product. So when you say 30% yield grade um, uh, fours and fives, and like I said, fives, I, I, I hate the term even of a five, but, but I still think there's a great need for that. And then I thought it was also very interesting that the shear force from Australia, once they started to key more into um, lean meat production, went up. So I, I thought they were, uh, that was a very interesting thing also. So thank you. So the shear force, uh, and even with our data from uh, Meat Animal Research Center, with those more muscular animals of the Suffolk, the Texel, and the Dorf Dorset, our shear force was a higher than more of the wool breeds and the hair sheep breeds as well. So their selection for that um, would follow similar to what breed differences we were able to see and evaluate in the USDA Meat Animal Research Center. Uh, and in terms of acceptability of yield grade threes and fours, um, I think that there is room in the food service industry for muscular and large uh, rib uh, racks and loin shops, no doubt, um, and, and maybe even at yield grade threes, because you can be able to do that. But yield grade fours uh, allows us four tenths of an inch on that loin eye. And simply in terms of plate presence, uh, the individuals can't be excited about having four tenths to a half of an inch of back fat on that. And just as critical relative to those that are yield grade fours and yield grade fives, 
uh, and the fives are, I mean, is, is management area at that point. Um, but those that are yield grade fives, uh, not only is the problem of the external fat, but also the intermuscular fat or that seam fat it can cause those huge challenges. Like I showed with that uh, butcher in Utah of fabricating those shoulders and having it cut so much off, uh, there's problems no matter who has to cut it. And so I'm not willing to consider it uh, acceptable. I'm willing to consider that there is a need and necessity for large uh, muscular chops. And with some of that relative to physiological growth, you're going to get to yield grade threes and maybe some that get to yield grade fours at 160 pounds. To use a crossbred lamb that makes it to 160 pounds and has an 80, 85 pound carcass, there's room for those. And we merchandise those, but we don't need yield grade fives. Okay. We have another yield grade, grade question. Andrea, I don't, I'm going to unmute your uh, phone if you're there. Andrea, are you there? You had a question on yield grade, I believe. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. My question to you is uh, you mentioned the target we should be aiming for is yield grade two and three. Can you speak to yield grade one? Oh, great question. So if you choose to aim for yield grade one, uh, that's just fine. But even if you're at, at 15 hundredths of back fat, okay? So 15 hundredths and the equation is multiply that by 10 plus 0.4. So it's at 15 hundredths of back fat gets you a yield grade in theory 1.9. So 16 hundredths gets you to a yield grade two. And so the challenge is, is that if you get much less than 0 0.15 inches of back fat, you'll also have a, a challenge in cooler shrink, okay? And so since there's less fat or insulation on the outside of the carcass, you will lose, potentially lose more weight of those carcass from a hot carcass to a cold carcass. And if they're below a tenth of an, uh, a tenth of an inch, Potentially, those will not get graded USDA choice and could go straight to good, which you would lose value. And um, there's also a possibility that those that meat cools too quickly and then causes challenges on cold shortening. And so even though we are aiming for a trim carcass, 15 hundredths is on the low end of acceptability. Okay. Thanks. That's a good question. Yeah, and we had a lot of questions on loin eye area. I'm going to ask that first, and then I'll get to uh, John, uh, who has his hand up too, and I think he has something along the line, these same lines. But uh, uh, you spent a lot of time looking at that uh, loin eye area and whatnot, but I'll just give you a series of questions here, and you can address them. One of them says, U.S. lambs are larger because uh, sheep in general are older and heavier when they're slaughtered. You know, how does that uh, affect things in terms of loin eye area, and how is that considered, or what are your comments on that? Uh, somebody else mentioned that uh, they uh, just recently uh, uh, bar or butchered some 66-pound lambs and had a barbecue with a whole bunch of lamb chops. People loved them. They were small. They just had to eat more of them. That's true. <laughs> so just the idea of age on there. And then finally, somebody asked a question on tying loin uh, eye area and loin size to carcass weight. Um, anyway, go, go ahead and address that in terms of U.S. lambs and age and, and carcass weight size and all that in terms of how that ties into the loin eye area. Well, thanks for being a tremendous moderator, uh, Dr. Parsons, because those are truthfully all the same question, just yeah. asked differently. Mm -hmm. And so the loin eye, um, they're related to weight. Of course, loin eye will increase. And if you go back to our data on the gate to rail, Loin eye did and rib eye did increase with weight. It's just a function of what there is relative to the regression equation. Those that are fed to heavier and higher weights will have an increase in weight. The difference is, is that you talk about it, um, an eight-year-old is growing taller, a 12-year-old is growing taller. A 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, all right, is growing massive, all right, growing muscular. And the 36-year-old is no longer growing taller and no longer growing more muscular. And so whatever weight that uh, I choose to put on or take off is not muscle anymore. And that's the fact relative to the physiological curve that is the sheep industry. I totally agree that those that have lambs that are 66 pounds, they had to eat more loin chops, but it is a high quality product. And that's why we're actually seeing a change in the marketplace of where lambs are harvested. Okay. Thank you. And John, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. I, I've seen several com questions come in from you, so I'm not sure which one you want to ask. But uh, John, are you there? <laughs> yeah, hi there. Hi. Yeah, good, 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 good to be talking, Travis. Uh, just very quickly, on, on the question of age, um, obviously all, 
all the other sheep producing nations uh, use dentition. And the break joint is an anomaly. You smile. Uh, the, <laughs> it's an anomaly for the U.S. system. And uh, I just wondered what your thoughts are. Uh, you know, how how reasonable is it to actually move to a dentition-based system for age aging sheep and lambs here? Uh, who in, who invited John to the uh, seminar? That's what I want to know. <laughs> we, I'm just kidding. We let everybody in. <laughs> I know. Thank you for the question, John. Uh, I this is as contentious an issue as any. Um, I think that. Uh, uh, that there is variability in both. Let me tell you one thing, because uh, I am obviously not the first person um, in uh, this this industry, and I've had a tremendous mentor, um, or tremendous mentors, particularly at Colorado State University, but one of those was J. Darrell Tatum, and J. Darrell Tatum believed that with the eruption of the first incisor, that's going to come at, you know, 12 to 14 months. Break joints potentially can happen at 14 to 16, Okay, and so we don't want to knock some of those out. But what Dr. Tatum, uh, um, his preference was before he retired was to say, why can't we use the eruption of the third incisor as an indication and say, you know what, you're out. Okay, you're mutton. Because right now, even though we use break joint to identify USDA choice and better from ungraded lamb, and ungraded lamb, uh, you know, takes a market discount, no, no arguments but it still can be merchandised as lamb. And so if you said, you know what, these lamb or these ovine individuals that at least have the eruption of the third incisor, they're old. Let's segregate them. They're over a year. We know that. And so I think that that more strict line in the sand uh, could be evaluated if I follow the lead of my mentor. Right now, and yes, good. every country, it seems like every country in the world chooses dentition and we choose not. Okay. John, I know you had a question on feedlots or a comment on feedlots versus grass fed. Do you want to go ahead and ask that well, one thank too? You guys for the opportunity to, to pester Travis a bit more. That, yeah. that's good. Well, a lot of people have asked about grass fed versus grain fed. So you can lead us into that conversation here. I know we're running over time here, but Travis ran long, so he gets punished with more questions. They'll punish him. <laughs> Travis, just very quickly, um, there was a feature recently about double J feedlot and it attracted a lot of interest online that something like 12 or 13,000 people looked at it. On, on several forums, w one of the issues that, that came up was that, uh, you know, something like 400,000, 500,000 lambs go through double J, pass through the feedlot system. And, and that, uh, I, think, I think people need to realize why that system is so important, because obviously these lambs are reared in situations where they can't be finished. And, and don't, do you see that as a kind of a, uh, for that quantity of lambs, nearly half a million lambs, it's very important that the public are made aware why it's necessary. Uh, so the lamb industry, in my personal opinion, different to most industries, whether it's a potato or a bee or somewhere in between, uh, has a seasonality challenge. And the feed yard operations, uh, such as Double J um, in Colorado, provides us the opportunity to produce a year-round supply of fresh lamb. Okay, if you have honey, guess what? You know, it doesn't always have to be straight out of the beehive. There's uh, options that you can have. We are in a market where we are producing fresh product. And in order to do that, we need to merchandise or evaluate our supply and our inventory management better than anything else. And so logistically wise and supply chain wise, we're at a difference, but there is no doubt uh, a necessity and our feed yard operators do a tremendous uh, and important um, product and provide a product so that we can keep our harvest facilities open. Different, a quick difference relative in a generalization then relative to those grain fed animals, uh, the grain fed animals in a generalization across most research would be a little bit milder than uh, different grasses or legumes like an alfalfa driven or a rapeseed or canola uh, approach. The uh, other thing is, is that you can't put all grass fed lamb in as the same. If you were to talk about lamb that is grown in Scotland and Wales, that's grown on grass, but it might be grown on rye grass or at least lush grasses that are very different than the sagebrush in Texas. So you can't put all forage fed and forage finished animals in the same boat relative to expected flavor profiles. But thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I'm convinced, and of course, I spent a lot of my uh, time in life 
at Colorado State University and uh, I got to work with some of the best uh, lamb feeders uh, in America. And so they do a great job and it's not, and we can't point fingers relative to even the challenges and the opportunities that we've been able to accomplish. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the flavor. Uh, just to follow up on that grass fed, I mentioned we got some there. So we'll follow up with that. And then, Paul, I see your hands up. So we'll get to you and, and then we'll try to wrap it up after that. But uh, and, and relative to grass fed versus grain fed, somebody asked about all grass fed. Can you comment on the effect of pastured all grass fed on the composition of the fats? eating satisfaction. I think you've started to address that a little bit with it. Uh, somebody else asked about our Australia and New Zealand filling the grass fed demand. Um, so, you know, do we need American grass fed, I guess is what we're getting at there. And then, uh, and then anything else in terms of specific research uh, references that you might have on grass fed having more bold flavor. So. Okay, so the difference is, is relative to the best of my knowledge of the biohydrogenation of the fats uh, in the rumen. And so when we talk about the rumen, there's differences of which ones become more saturated and which ones become less uh, saturated or have greater amount of double bonds. And those that have greater amount of double bonds would be considered poly unsaturated fatty acids, okay? And so PUFA, often the, 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 the acronym that's used relative to those unsaturated fatty acids. When there is greater amount of those unsaturated fatty acids that happens because of less biohydrogenation in the rumen of the animal and in the absorption in the small intestine along the digestive tract, that you have a difference in change. And as you are well aware, some of the differences in omega-3s and omega-6s, but please don't make that label claim uh, because it is not biologically different enough to, to play on a label claim. But there's differences relative to those unsaturated fats. And with those branch chain fatty acids, you have more of those branch chain fatty acids that are attributed to um, the lamb flavor and the intensity flavors. So that does happen uh, from that standpoint. Question is, is does Australia and New Zealand uh, fill the void necessary to grass fed? Um, it's a tricky question. They do that because that's what their production system says. They do that because they can't grow corn like we can in Iowa, all right? Um, that, that's how their production system is. But I think that there's room for those individuals in America that want to choose pasture finished and grass-based systems if that's what fits their production system. And in fact, if they choose based on a mentality uh, that their customer may or may not like that just a little bit better, um, then and there is there will be people that like a more intense lamb flavor the difference is is that those outliers and in fact here's some research that the american lamb board again is is grabbing and a lot of this research that i accomplished through the national lamb quality audit and other research was funded through the lamb checkoff dollar and uh, through the american lamb board and so i appreciate their work but some of that is is that we can identify those that are more pungent or more bold or, or that are on the edge of acceptability with those off flavors. And so not just providing that um, pasture finished lamb is the biggest hypocrite and challenge on flavor, but it's the accumulation of how we get a greater quantity of those branch chain fatty acids. It'll just shift it a little bit more. That was my best attempt, Jay. Okay, that, uh, that'll work. Okay, Paul, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone. Paul, are you there? Yep, I'm here. All right, fire away. Hey, Travis, long time no see. Yeah, welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, could you expand a little more on the need for performance testing and NSIP to overcome some of the challenges in improving the carcasses once we identify the need through the electronic grading and how, how that can fit in, particularly to the uh, fact that uh, growth and muscle are antagonistic to each other uh, generally and the need for that. Uh, that's a pretty loaded question, uh, Mr. Paul Lewis, but uh, <laughs> appreciate that. So with, with information, we have the opportunity to improve product. The advantage that I hope that I showed in the back end of my presentation is that Australia particularly has way more information than producers in America. And in fact, when I put that genetic trends of what they've been able to accomplish, I 
and I know that some breeds can do this relative to the Targis and the Polypays and identify genetic trends, but there's no way as an industry in American lamb that we can identify. We have greater post weaning weight. We have greater loin eye area. And so with this information, then we can make those selections. And if we have that, if we have ultrasound information, if we have uh, estimated breeding values, we can incorporate that. I just think that we're at the frontier of information to make production decisions. And so it'll be, uh, Paul, something that, that we can be able to make uh, our decisions along the way, uh, l unlike any other time in history. And so hopefully we can no longer be a commodity product and provide value for those that are of, uh, meeting the targets uh, that we're aiming for. And again, those um, those targets might be 70 pounds in New Holland, Pennsylvania, because there's trucks that get loaded in San Angelo, Texas, every week that drive to New England or New Holland, Pennsylvania, and make more money. But if we look at it from providing a 140 pound lamb and a 70 pound carcass, uh, there's some improvements that can be made. And the only way that we can do that, like I showed on the slide uh, with Mr. Mike Harper, is that the only way that we can improve is you have to manage what you can measure. Fantastic. Yeah, information is is king, right? So two quick uh, uh, housekeeping questions, and then we'll wrap up. One of them was a follow-up to the question on yield grade one lambs. If carcasses are being sold as whole, are the drawbacks that you mentioned to harvesting yield grade one lambs negated? I'm guessing the answer is um, no. One more time, Jay. If, if, if carcasses, carcasses are, are being sold as whole, are the drawbacks you mentioned for harvesting yield grade one lambs negated? I'm guessing the answer is no, but uh, I'm not the meat guy. <laughs> um, so there's still difference relative to the hot carcass weight to the cold carcass weight. And go. so those lambs that would be uh, in, in the, uh, commercial processing facilities, they'll load up, you know, several hundred, 200, 300 lambs in a um, refrigerated truck and they're weighed before they go on the truck. And so if they lost 2%, then they're getting paid on what went on the truck and they didn't get paid it, you know? Yeah. So it, it, it costs money along the way. Okay, and we'll wrap up with, uh, with a question that a lot of people have and that is, are there recommended hanging times for the carcass? Oh, good question. So I dug and tried to find as much information as I could, Jay, on aging and hanging times. The information that I was available to find in uh, American lamb and U.S. lamb was somewhere between zero and none. What I did find relative to Australia on their expectations and preferences on aging is they said a minimum of five days aging if those lambs had went through electrical stimulation. And in fact, most lambs, particularly at a custom exempt plant, would not go through electrical stimulation to improve, and that's because it improves tenderness. Now, I had a discussion with some colleagues here today as well to try to describe that. And in fact, since tenderness isn't our largest challenge, I don't know if it's a game breaker, but I will tell you that Australia is grabbing our market share. They're doing it, as I showed, with a more tender product. And if their lamb, in Australia is to be merchandised through the export trade, it requires a minimum of 10 days of aging. Hmm. So to the best of my knowledge, in in working with my colleagues here on trying to grab that, and uh, five to 10 should get us in a, a, a good ballpark. The difference is, is that if those, if it leaves the processing plant, a, a commercial processing plant, it's still gonna be aging in the package. There's muscle degradation of the proteins and the sarcomeres in the package until it's consumed. The only thing that, or the thing that stops aging is freezing of the animals. So those that do a custom exempt uh, standpoint, if you wanted to wait seven days, that would be fine. If you wanted to wait 10, you'd be a hero. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for a great presentation and handling all these questions. Thank you to the audience for all of the questions. Uh, sorry we didn't get to them all, but if we did, we would be here till about one in the morning. <laughs> and I'm sure Travis needs to get some. To do. You, you need to get some sleep. So obviously, this is a great topic, and uh, uh, I'll talk it over with Travis, and we'll talk to some other people and see maybe how we might follow up on this. We do have some other webinars coming up later in the year. As always, uh, please take the time to fill out the uh, um, 
uh, exit survey and let us know any ideas you have for future webinars so that we can try to get the best speakers lined up for them. Um, I want to thank ASI and the Let's Grow Committee for providing funding uh, for this program and all of our webinars. encourage you to visit the uh, ASI website at sheepusa.org. And thank you, Travis, for uh, a great presentation. And, and uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and sign off. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you, Jay. And of course, my contact information is available on the uh, last slide that's been up for the last 15 minutes there. So people can feel free to contact me with uh, further questions and I will do my best in an attempt at them. Fantastic. Thank you. Everybody have a good night.